but if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. It's right there in the middle. Right there in the middle. Amen. I'm going to read and then we'll pray. Matthew 20, verse 17, and I'm going to read through 28. When you've gotten there, would you please say amen? Amen. Amen. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, kneeling before him, She asked him for something, and he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you don't know what you're you're asking. (laughs) Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit on my right and to sit on my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today. I just ask you kindly, Lord God, to move every inch of Derek out of the way, Lord. The people didn't come to hear from me. They came to hear from on high today, Lord God. So I thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to be used this morning as your tool, Father. And just say what thus says the Lord. So, Lord God, bring back to remembrance those things that you would have me say today. We thank you and we love you on this last day of 2017. Let us go into the new year with a new mindset and a new love for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If I was to summarize this, and I don't have slides for us today, but if I was to summarize this chapter, this is how I would summarize it. The family didn't truly understand the gravity of the favor that was being requested. So this favor became a teachable leadership moment in the life of the disciples to begin to recognize what true greatness is all about. I've been studying a little bit uh, about leadership, and I want to come to us today so, so we can get a little glimpse of the leader, the servant leader that we call Jesus Christ. Amen? And so when I began to look at this text and and think about the things that we're doing, John Maxwell is one of my favorite authors. And he says, everything rises and falls on leadership. Right? Right? Everything rises and falls on leadership. And RCF has... Uh, a goal this year in 2018 to raise up 22 leaders if not more and we need to understand what the master says how we should act and how how we should lead in this kingdom there are three items 
that the authors, the, the Maxwells and the, the Browns, the Les Browns, and that say that a leader should have that sets them apart from anybody else. One, a leader should know his purpose. And we might call it calling. Now, what I've titled this message today is The Five C's of Leadership. And I'm about to give you one of them, so I'm only going to give you one. All right? The other four, I'm going to have a pop quiz when we get done. So I want to make sure everybody knows what the C's are. So the first thing they said was purpose. You have to know your purpose. And what we might call it is you might need to know your calling in life. What are you called to do? We can say and we can understand that Jesus was called to go to Calvary, amen? He was called to do what he was going to do for us in this life. Dennis Kimbrough, one of my writers, I love this saying, he says, a career is what you pay for, but a calling is what you're made for. And when you begin to understand your calling in life and what the master has for you, I tell you what, there will be purpose. When Jesus was going to that cross, we going through to Jerusalem, through Samaria, we're going to do everything we need to do because I got to get to my purpose. The second thing you need to have is knowledge. Continuous learning. Don't stop learning. Young people, keep learning. Older people, don't stop learning. Jesus talked to his father every single day to get that knowledge so that he can work with his what? His community group. See, I just think these disciples was a bunch of trainees that been on a two-year journey at this time, and Jesus was filling them up with knowledge in his little community group. But the third thing, all of the greats say, you have to serve. What are you doing to help somebody else? What are you doing to help somebody else? Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to do the serving. So when we begin to understand that, service makes us great. So we're going to talk through that. These trainees, as I'm going to call them, the disciples, It's okay to aspire to want to have more power, more empowerment, if you will, more authority. It's okay to aspire to those things. The business owner, I know we have some entrepreneurs out here. The business owner wants to, he wants to, or she wants to make their schedule better. They want to have more time to do the things that they want to do. They want to make more money. But it's no different than the parent that wants to begin a family. That's leadership. It's no different than the young men that help me in the parking lot or the greeters at the door leading people to a chair like the ushers do or uh, leading people to a parking space. It's all leadership. And leadership is okay to aspire to. So where I would like to pick up the story is in Verse 20 of chapter 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him, and with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. (laughs) And 21 says, and he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. So when I begin to read this this chapter, it seems a little dysfunctional. I wanted to know who the mother of Zebedee was, right? So we got to start there. And then you could think that Jesus was about two years into his ministry. And so that would make him probably somewhere around 32 years old or so. Where these disciples could have been maybe a couple years, 32 or up, somewhere up in there. So, where is Zebedee? You know, back in this time, where is daddy? Where, where is he when they're making this request? 
things look a little bit shaky. Yeah, yeah. And then why are you asking Jesus a favor for your two grown sons? All right. Hmm. Yeah. Well, what, what's going on in the text? Yeah. All right, and then when we start to dig deeper, we find out the wife of Zebedee, her name is Salome. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Her name is Salome. Her sister is Mary, who is the mother of Jesus, which would make Salome Jesus' aunt. Now the text start getting a little bit clearer. See, this looked like an entitlement moment. Auntie is going to go over to Jesus and say, hey, I need a favor for your cousins, James and John. See, that's what began to happen. Salome said, look, we got a position, y'all. So can't you see them powwowing before she goes to it? And, and, and James and John say, look, hey, hey, Jesus just got through telling us about uh, we going through Jerusalem. Uh, and this son of man, whoever that cat is, he's getting ready to die. But we know that Jesus is about to bring forth his kingdom. So I want, I want to sit on his right and I want James to sit on his left. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. So now remind Jesus. You, you remember, Mama, when we was when we was in Jerusalem at that feast, and Jesus stayed behind, and we didn't walked all the way down uh, by the day's travel, and everybody looking for Jesus. Remember what happened, Mama? Mary, Uncle Uncle Joseph, and Aunt Mary. They was they was upset, and you you just coddled Jesus as y'all was walking back and said, "It's okay, it's okay with." And so you can hear that conversation. So when Mary makes this, this request of Jesus, it's an entitlement moment. She wanted to play the, the, the family trump card, if you will, right? That's what she was doing. As subtle as it might have been, she did come kneeling, but she wanted to play the trump card, the family trump, to get her boys into position. But what we know about entitlement is, it don't care nothing about yeah. nobody else. Yeah. Entitlement is a leadership nightmare. Yeah. And so you, when, you, when you begin to do that, yeah. it becomes a problem. And we'll see as we flush this out yeah. Yeah. Um, in the text. Yeah. Matthew 20, 22 reads, Jesus answered, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. <laughs> See, sometimes you want the crown of leadership, but can you handle the cup of leadership? Those are two different things now. Sometimes we want the crown. We aspire for the crown. But can you handle the cup is what I'm talking about. See, the crown represents your public platform. You hear what I'm saying? But that cup represents your private pain. Huh? Huh? That cup is something that goes on your head. And it gives you the power and the authority and all the stuff that comes with the crown. But the cup goes into your mouth. And there's a bitterness of depression and loneliness. You see what I'm saying with that crown and cup? They go together. You can't get the crown without that cup. You can't get the crown without that cup. See, the crown will make you famous. <laughs> but the cup will make you famished. <laughs> it'll have you going. Uh, it'll have you hungry, horny, excited about stuff that you shouldn't be. It'll have you digging through private trash cans, eating out of eating food that kings and queens don't eat from. That cup is dangerous. But see, they put God put that cup in place to keep us humble. See that crown and that cup, man, you gotta be humbled when you come to it. It keeps you balanced. It keeps you balanced when you go through it. There will be times that you'll be thrust into a leadership position. As soon as he puts you there, your marriage starts messing up. 
things start to happen. That's that cup. There'll be times when you're broke like no other joke. But you still got to do ministry. It's going to be those times. And we got to begin to understand that that cup. Now, I don't know why he gives us a cup for different situations, Pastor. There's a cup called cancer. It goes with a crown. See, I know you know about that. Huh? I know you know about that, Patrick. There's a cup. I know a lot of y'all know about that cup. He's trying to get us through. There's a cup of moral failings that you don't come back from. There's a cup of discouragement that he lays on you sometimes. There's a cup, again, on finances. And I remember that cup because I served that cup. That cup on finances is serious. I remember when I was on the bathroom floor in my house. See, I've said my testimony before. I remember when everything was going to be taken from me. I remember making a deal with God at that very moment because I said, I can't handle this cup. I I wish I would have known what I was getting into. I I might have went on and got a job in Lowe's somewhere and not deal with that kind of cup. But he had to take everything from me in my cup. He had to take everything that I had so that he could get me back on the right direction and on the right path. That crown has to go with that cup. But let me tell you what precedes the calling, the crown, and the cup. It's the cross. See, the cross, the cross, where we'll get a chance to come down to in this last day of 2017. The cross allows you to surrender. The cup, the cup deals with shame and sorrow and selfishness. But see, that cross had to come before everything. See, he laid it down for us. That's what he did. He laid it down, laid that cross down for us so that we could surrender and turn over the keys to our soul. And sometimes he had to make you lay on the floor to realize it. Sometimes you got to be in a hospital bed with cancer to realize what he wants us to do. Because we've given him that right. God is not a bully. When you come to the cross, you give him permission to reign and rule in your life. So in order to reign and rule in your life, he'll give you that crown. But he also going to give you that cup. And we got to remember that. So I hope y'all remember my my pop quiz coming. We about on four C's right now. All right? Matthew 20, 23. Matthew 20, 23. I like this scripture here because it's a hard one. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but sitting at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. He said, you're going to drink the cup. Yeah, anybody that calls the name of Jesus, we're going to drink that cup. See, and in this story, we're talking about the 12, but the two main figures here, James and John. See, James had a meeting with Herod's sword. And John was isolated and put on the island of Patmos. We're going to drink the cup. Suffering is going to come our way. There's going to be some down. Has anybody ever experienced some downtime? Everybody? Yeah. So all this mess about, you know, this prosperity stuff. Hey, if Jesus had to go through it, we gonna have to go through it. And so when you begin to understand that the cup will be there, we understand that. And we work through it and we we deal with the things that we need to deal with. So we gonna have to share in that cup. But it was interesting that he said to them, 
but the honor of putting somebody on my left and on my right is not mine to grant. That's left up to my father. And so I began to look, we just looked at that. And what I believe he was saying is that we all going to have a cup. And depending on your level of cup on this earth is going to be commensurate or proportional to the level of crown that you will get in glory. See, that becomes a little interesting. That becomes a little interesting. Let me say it a different way. We're going to have some suffering in this world. There's people not in the United States of America that name the name of Jesus that have, is going through so much more than we could ever think about. They can't even bring a Bible uh, to church without their cars being searched. See, we have privileges that we don't even understand. Who puts suffering on us? We can talk about this later, but I believe God does. I believe God puts suffering on us because of the crown, because of the cross, excuse me. See, at the cross, God didn't tell you nothing about the crown and the cup, but you gave him permission. So to make sure we stay right, he positioned us to be able to put the crown and the cup in our life. Not the ones that we do, but the ones that we can control. He can put that in our life to see where we are at in our walk. And so we have to begin to understand that. And I know that's hard to hear because we, we praise God. And we say, God, don't, God won't give us cancer. God won't take our money away. And I came here and by to tell you, God will do everything he has to do to get you back, in, get you back going to where he wants you to be or to bless somebody else. That's what God will do. He will determine everything that, that we have to do. Paul says it's like, like this in Romans 8 and 18. I consider that our present suffering, <laughs> our present suffering is not even comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. See, Paul went through a couple of things. Would you agree? Paul went through a couple of things. And so he said, look, whatever we're going through today, what God is going to give us in eternity is not even comparable. So you got to keep believing and you got to keep working towards what God wants us to work towards. And that's being a servant. That's being a servant. So in 2018, we're looking for servants yeah, that's it. because God said you can't do it both ways. You can't do it both ways. Matthew 20 and 24, yeah. getting through this. Amen. Yeah. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. You know why they was indignant? Because <laughs> everybody wanted to ask the same question that Aunt Salome was asking. All of them wanted to be on his right and left. They was just, that's what happens when you become indignant. Somebody then beat you to the punch. What you really wanted. You really wanted to be on his right and left. Yeah, that's what happened. And so they were a little bit upset about that. But then Jesus pulls them to the side in 25. And he says... But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. The Roman Empire, the Gentiles, they had a hierarchical structure, right? So it was all one directional. And so he was letting them know, y'all can't be one directional. Everything coming from the top, everything coming from the Herods that were on thing, and they was just as corrupt as you don't know what. And it went all the way down. And the people down here never had an opportunity to say a word. And so he was teaching them, and I'm about to turn everything upside down in his teaching. So let's go to 26. I'm just going to read through the end, and we're almost done. Not be so among you, verse 26, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you 
must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. We call these the complexity of leadership. And Jesus being our model, y'all remember when Jesus was going to um, wipe the disciples' feet, wash the disciples' feet, what he's saying with two-way leadership, it's not just one directional, it's two-way. And, and Jesus shows us this in many, many examples. So when he was going to wash, his, wash the disciples' feet, he took off his outer garment he got a basin of water because his towel was much bigger than his title. Yeah, yeah, you hear what yeah, I'm saying? Nice, nice, nice. The king of kings yeah. and the lord of lords, yeah, yeah. his towel yeah. was much yeah. bigger yeah. than his title. Nice, nice. And we got to understand that. Yeah. We, should, we shouldn't have to come into a house. There shouldn't be a difference between a pastor and a deacon or a vice president in the front line because we all serving. Yeah. Remember, they had everything in common. Yeah. Yeah. God don't want us to have that, that title. See, we, we do good with titles yeah. Yeah. and lord over. And that's what he was saying those Gentiles do. They just lord over people. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want y'all to be like that. Yeah. Talking to this church, yeah. I don't want y'all to be like that. Yeah. You need to serve just as much as you rule. And what they call that uh, is the alpha and the omega. Yeah, yeah. The alpha and the omega. See, the alpha is the first letter of the Greek language. Yeah, yeah. And the omega is the last letter of the Greek language. See, there's a lot of us that do good in alpha. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you puff your chest out and you're walking around. Lord and over people, giving all the instructions. All right, all right. <laughs> but when I ask you to pick up a, a, a cloth and wipe some tables and put up some chairs, you stay away from that. <laughs> then we got some people that love Omega. Yeah. They stay behind the scenes. Right. They don't want to make no decisions. Yeah. They just want to be back and quiet and never say a word. Mm. But sometimes you have to make some decisions. See, let me see if I can give y'all an example. I know y'all tired, y'all ready. Jesus, y'all remember when he came on the donkey down that road and they was laying palms in front of him and he was sitting on that donkey and, and he was Lord and he was God and he was in charge of things. Ah, but a couple of, couple of uh, miles later, he went up that that, that, that stairway up to the upper room and took off that album garment and he began to wash the feet of the disciple because then he was Omega watching the feet of the disciples that were going to betray him. Okay, I see this a slow crowd. <laughs> I see this a slow crowd. When he was on Calvary <laughs> and he had one to his right <laughs> And he had one to his left. Huh? And the thief on the, on the left side said, Lord, on this day, can I be with you in paradise? And because he's a, a alpha, and because he's alpha, he said, this day, you will be with me. And if anybody say something, tell him alpha sent you by. Huh? Because he was alpha. But two hours later, when the heavens shut their doors on him, and his father turned his back. Huh? huh? He became Omega. Huh? He said, Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? Huh? But he had to become Omega for me and you, for you and I to live. He had to become Omega. Huh? That's a little bit better. Here's the last one. Y'all remember when he went into the temple? Huh? And he started wrecking stuff and turning over tables and brought a whip. He was alpha. He said, y'all ain't going to mess around in my daddy's house. So I want all y'all up out of here. That was alpha. But when they began to beat his own body and they began to slap him with the cat of nine tails and they beat him up, he didn't say a mumbling word. 
because he was Omega. And he had to do what he had to do. See, we got to learn how to be Alpha and Omega. You got to understand what service is. We need some leaders that understand that, comp that concept. That want to get out and help somebody. See, I want you to have some new resolutions this year. Some new resolutions. Come on, worship team. Some new resolutions. See, we always are inner-focused on what we need to do in 2018. I'm going to challenge you to be outer-focused, to go and help somebody that needs your help, to go, and, to, go to a, a soup kitchen and bring your family with you and serve some people that don't get served too often, to go like my wife did the other night. I saw a, a young lady sitting on a stool in the cold and decided, I'm going to serve somebody today. So I'm going to go at Walgreens and I'm going to get some gloves and I'm going to get her a coat and I'm going to talk with her for a little while when we're all so busy all the time. Those people become invisible to us. They become invisible to us. And when we begin to understand that God turned this thing out, he wanted us to be both Alpha and Omega. That's what I came by to tell you today, church. It's about your service in 2018. We want to lift up leaders in this place that will go do what thus says the Lord. So here's the pop quiz. This is your time for audience participation. What is the first C? Your calling. Your calling. Know your purpose in life. Know your purpose, your direction. And if you don't know it, just start with loving people being obedient and going to serve somebody every now and again. What's the second C? And what goes with the crown? Crown and cup go together. If you aspire to lead, there's going to be some cup in your life. And you got to walk it out. But my Bible says he'll never leave me nor forsake me. David said there's no place I can go without you being there, Father. What is the fourth cup? The cross. The cross. The cross is where you surrender. The cross is where you say, I want to stop living for myself. I want to stop making my own decisions. I need your help, Holy Spirit. See, he got me out of bankruptcy. He didn't got me out of everything. He didn't got my pastor off, off the bed of cancer when he flatlined three times on it. So he has a work. And what's that final cause? What do we call it? Y'all remember? Complexity of leadership. Complexity. We got to be alpha sometimes. And we got to be omega sometimes. Church, it's about your service. It's about your leadership in 2018. Some people need to be led. Not led to know you. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago, Pastor did. We're the pointers. Who are you helping to point to him? That's who we are. We're pointers. And we got to point them straight to the Father because he has the answers. He has the answers. So I know this may have sounded like a difficult word today, but as you go into 2017, 2018, remember these things. Think differently. Act differently. And he'll let you walk it out with him through the good times and the bad. Amen.